The following program will make you want to grow things and experience new and wonderful dreams about your plants, garden, and garden design. Listener participation is always strongly advised. And welcome to you down the garden path with your host Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing right here on Reality Radio 101. To get on board, send us an email right now. Our email address is instudio101 at gmail.com. To your hosts of Down the Garden Path, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing. Thank you and welcome everyone to this episode of Down the Garden Path, where each week we discuss down to earth tips and advice for your plants, gardens, and landscapes. As landscape designers and gardeners, we think it is important and possible to have a great garden and gardens that are low maintenance, and we want to help you make it happen. I'm Joanne Shaw, landscape designer and owner of Down to Earth Landscape Design here east of the GTA in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And with me is Matthew Dressing. Welcome, Matthew. Thank you, Joanne. Welcome, Joanne. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, I'm Matthew Dressing, horticulturist and landscape designer and owner of Natural Affinity Designs. Natural Affinity is a landscape design and garden maintenance firm servicing Toronto and the eastern GTA. Joanne and I enjoy doing Down the Garden Path each week, bringing you relevant, uh, interesting, relevant, and helpful topics to help you achieve a great garden. We learn right along with you from each other, from our research, and from the guests that join us here on the show. As always, we welcome your questions via social media and emails. That's right. That's right. And we want to thank you again for joining us here on Down the Garden Path and remind everyone, uh, if you like us, uh, please, or if you're new here, uh, we are available as a podcast. So remember to subscribe to the Down the Garden Path podcast on your favorite podcast app for instant updates and you'll find out right away when uh, new shows go live. So, uh, so yeah, so that's always exciting. I like to remind everybody about that. I know I get the, the, the pop-ups when we go yes a new episode for sure for sure <laughs> so that's good it's enjoyable so as spring is still taking its time arriving yes. we are excited to talk about um you know a, a, i think a popular topic these days it's in uh, in the headlines of the news and that's talking about our urban forests yeah and uh so i'm really uh, looking forward to our guest uh and our topic today so our urban forests are more than just the last remaining ravines and parks. Our urban forests includes our street trees, trees and shrubs we plant in our yards and our gardens. And tonight we are joined by Janet McKay of LEAF, which stands for Local Enhancement Appreciation of Forests, to discuss LEAF's mission and their many programs on how to plant care and support our urban forests so we'd like to invite our listeners to send in their questions to janet about leaf uh, their initiatives and how do we get involved there's a it's a quite a extensive volunteer program as well so yeah. i'm really looking forward to that and uh so we'll tell you a little bit more about janet yeah mm -hmm. so uh janet holds uh, and honors a ba in environmental and resource management she founded uh, leaf in 1996 and has focused on its evolution ever since uh, janet is also a founding member of green infrastructure ontario coalition in her time away from uh, leaf she enjoys traveling hiking volunteering with a dog rescue organization 
Excellent. Nice. Well, welcome to the show, Janet. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Oh, it's quite that. It's great because there's information on you and the program. So I think uh, I think that's uh, we're happy to have you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, why don't we start the the right off of the bat and tell have you tell us a bit more about how you started Leaf? Sure. Well, I I grew up in the country, so I'm a country girl at heart, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I always knew that I felt a special connection to the environment. I didn't know what I wanted to do exactly, but I I did decide to study um, environmental issues at university. Um, And I, it was a fairly academic um, kind of a course. Um, And it wasn't until after university when I went uh, traveling and I actually took a permaculture course uh, the light went on for me ah. and I found um, something that truly resonated and, and something, a philosophy for me that just suddenly connected a lot of dots and I realized, wow, th- this is it. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing you guys might be familiar with permaculture. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, for me, the philosophy of um, rather than tackling nature, sort of observing nature understanding understanding the patterns that happen in nature and then trying to mimic those in our own uh, settlements, in our own gardens, in the way that we grow food, in the way that we design our, our, our living spaces. Um, I just thought that made so much sense. And you know, we're going back probably more years than I care to think of. But back then, <laughs> the, you know, now it doesn't seem so, so uh, you know, revolutionary of an idea. But back then it kind of was. Yeah. And, and uh, for me, I just thought that that's it. That's what was missing. Because I was, I was always a little bit different, like, <laughs> on the farm. <laughs> I grew up on a pretty conventional farm. Um, and permaculture was turning that on its head for me. So ah. one example for listeners, like, conventional agriculture would be um, clear the land, plant one crop in straight lines using a lot of inputs like machinery, mm-hmm. fuel, uh, you know, engineered seed fertilizer, and then you get out of that, say one, co- one crop or commodity. Right. Um, and you know, on our farm, I know we we would grow corn one year, peas, and then beans, and it was a rotation. Um, and the rotation of the crop was pretty much the only environmental kind of consciousness <laughs> that that there was. Um, aside from that, it was very uh, far removed, really, right. from from the natural patterns in nature and so when I started to learn about permaculture it just yeah it just sort of really um made everything kind of make sense to me like that's what I've been missing and that message of uh acting locally observing nature um, respecting nature and following its patterns which have taken millions and millions of years to develop I mean nature has it all figured out Mm -hmm. we just have to kind of observe right and um yeah, that's kind of where it started. So when I came back to um, to Canada after traveling around, I did my course in Ecuador and learned so much and, you know, just really enjoyed my travels that came back to Toronto, um, finding myself in a city kind of out of sorts, really, because I'm, you know, I had never lived in a big city before. And I don't know, I think I just really started to think about those principles and look around and say, what can I do locally? So um, I just, I got involved in the community gardening uh, community here in Toronto, which was really wonderful. I met a lot of great people. And then I just started to look at what are the opportunities here. And for me, there was a lot of space in backyards. Mm-hmm. And I lived in Leslieville, and, and it wasn't even, we didn't even call it Leslieville back when I first moved in there. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I find it interesting that you grew up and you went, traveled, and you went back into the city. You came back and went to the city. I did. And, you know, I really thought it was going to be a short term kind of thing, uh, you know, like, oh, I'll try this out. It'll yeah. be different. Yeah. I had a friend living here. I really didn't think I would be here long. And now we're like 23 years, four years later, <laughs> and I'm still here. But I think I, you know, it was a combination of things of those permaculture principles, looking around, thinking, what can I do locally? What are the opportunities that I see around me? And also, how do I keep my sanity in the middle of this concrete jungle? Right. I, I, you know, I like to have my hands in the dirt. So, um, yeah, I just, I, I, I met a lot of really amazing people and just started to, to make connections and 
and see where I could make a difference, really. And, and it sort of landed on this idea of uh, planting native trees, um, particularly in backyards, mm-hmm. um, where there is uh, a lot of available space. Right. And really no support at that time for property owners to make good choices around that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of the seed of where the idea started. Excellent, excellent. And getting that off the ground. Um, so your your organization is working in 12 municipalities right now, correct? Mm-hmm. It is. We have evolved a lot over the last 20-some-odd uh, years. Uh starting with a very modest that backyard tree planting program, but that's still our core program okay. today. Excellent. Um, it has evolved and improved a lot over the years. And as you say now, we're in, we're in 12 municipalities. Um, we have really great partnerships that have allowed us to, to offer the program um, in a much wider geographic area. We've really stuck to those core principles. Um, you know, it's right tree, right place, right care. Right. And, uh, we really uh, see that the people who participate in our program as um, partners and they, you know, we help them make some of the initial choices around uh, what to plant and where to plant it. But they have the, you know, the long-term job of being the steward and, Mm -hmm. and that's the most important thing. And so, you know, we really see the processes um, hand in hand. We kind of go through it together and, and really our goal is to have the uh, property owner come out, being a really great urban forest steward and having the tools to take care of that tree to maturity. Well, have you found that I would think that the educate the homeowners are far more educated now than they were 20 years ago? Or oh, absolutely. Yes. Okay. So it's much more, uh, yeah. So it is much more um, educated and much more responsible, that type of thing. Yeah. And I mean, back 20 years ago, I, I mean, I remember when I first heard the term urban forest and it, it was several years after I even got started into this whole thing. And it was, um, uh, you know, Dr. Andy Kenny, who was my mentor, uh, he used to be at U of T, he's now okay. retired. Um, but I remember hearing him speak. And when he, you know, when, when I heard the term urban forest, again, it was kind of one of those moments again, where it's like, wow, yeah, it's not just single trees. Like we're part of an urban forest mm-hmm. and what we're doing is part of a much bigger picture mm-hmm. uh, but each one of us can do something small to kind of add to that so but yeah I mean it's so much more uh, understood now and and you know uh, like you said it's it's a to- it's a hot topic and right. people are talking about it mm-hmm. and really motivated to to do things to help the urban forest thrive yeah because I, I don't know 20 years ago if people were even aware of native trees versus non-native trees mm-hmm. like you know oh plant a maple tree right it's na- you know that type of thing so I'm sure there must be a good a- educational portion to what you do and helping people pick because it's not not all native trees are created equal right you want to have the right plant like you said the right plant for the right spot that's right and I mean even today we find uh the, the education component is so important because it, it is hard to, I mean, people are busy. They uh, have so many priorities in life. A lot of people, you know, do understand the difference between, say, a Norway maple and a native sugar maple, but then a lot of people don't. I right. mean, you know, you can still go to a nursery, and if you ask for a maple, chances are you might get a Norway, but, yeah. you're, you know, unless you know what to ask for, you know, mm-hmm. the native, uh, or sorry, the Latin term uh, to use, you might not know what what exactly you're getting. So um, we still find that our education piece is really important. And I think that's what people really love about our program mm-hmm. is that uh, we do, it is very much, uh, you know, a one-on-one kind of service. And it uh, includes a, a consultation with one of our arborists. So we have two versions of the program. One is sort of full service. Okay. And that's where we do, uh, people fill, fill in an application online. So the program is subsidized. So mainly now our partners are um, regional or municipal governments, okay. and they have an interest in increasing the urban forest. Many of them now have done urban forest studies, and they have an urban forest plan, and they have targets. Um, a lot of, a common sort of target for urban forest cover is something, say, between 30 and 40 percent, and uh, most municipalities are, are under that. Right. And, they have uh, 
really come to understand that private property is where the potential planting mm. space lies. Okay. And so, uh, you know, understanding how to engage uh, so many individual property owners in a common goal, it's, right. it's a challenge. But, um, you know, our program is there to help people get over barriers and to try to make good choices. So they fill in an application online. Um, it is subsidized, so depending on where you live, you might it, it, the the cost is a little different. But on average, it's around um, two hundred dollars for the client, and what that includes is the consultation with the arborist. So we come out for about a forty-five minute one-on-one. People love that part of the program. <laughs> yes. um, by the end of that visit, we've uh, helped you decide what to plant, where to plant it, and um, given some of those care um, messages and and resources. Um, and then we come back and do the actual planting. And okay. so you're getting like a, a five to seven foot tree um, delivered and planted, uh, as well as that arborist visit, all for that price of about $200. So Would, it's, a, it's yeah. a good deal. Yep, it is a very good deal. Yeah, and people love the service side of it. It's just, you know, one of the biggest barriers is I don't know what to plant. I, yeah. you know, I'm busy mm-hmm. and I'm not sure, so I'm going to put it off. I know I do a lot of that. You yeah. know, with different things around my house. If I don't know how to do it, I put it off. So, um, yeah, we're there to kind of help people through those choices. And, you know, most of us wouldn't necessarily think about things like, um, you know, how close, like, first of all, we look at light, soil type, and space. Right. Really important for success because you might want that, you know, uh, you know, white oak, but do you have the right soil for that right. tree or is it going to be kind of a losing battle? Um, you know, so we, we, we start with those basics mm-hmm. of what your sun, soil, and space is. Um, and then we start to look at, okay, how do you use the yard? What about underground utilities, overhead utilities, mm-hmm. uh, paved surfaces, closeness to buildings, any thoughts of, you know, additions or changes to the yard, maybe thinking of putting on a deck, um, all of those things. And then how, how do you use the yard? How do your kids use the yard or your pets? Um, how close to the property line do you want to plant thinking down the road as the tree right, grows? Right, yeah. And, um, and they always want to plant closer than they should, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you want to limit, you want to kind of maximize your usable space, but at yep. the same time, you might create a problem for yourself down the road. Exactly. Um, and so those are all important things. Mm-hmm. And then we get to aesthetics. That's right. <laughs> After all of that. Yeah. You know? So, and that's usually aesthetics are kind of the first go to oftentimes for people. They think about the aesthetic that they want but there's so many other things so Mm -hmm. yeah we find people are super open to learning about all of this like they get excited about learning this stuff and and making a good choice for themselves because it is a really long-term commitment planting a tree yeah for sure for sure i want to just go back for a second just about that target 34 30 to 40 percent for regional government so is so that's kind of the sweet spot and is that you know like you said is that standard across the 12 or across maybe you know many of the municipalities in Ontario? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's kind of a, that 30 to 40 percent target. It kind of comes out of research from uh, the U.S. and Canada, I would say, and um, where municipalities are across the province really varies. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think most are trying to achieve that goal. Some okay. of them are closer than others, yeah. and some of them have more um, rural and forested land, so mm-hmm. You know, depending on which municipality, yeah. um, the cover is, is different. Mm-hmm. But um, and you know, targets. I mean, it's it's uh, it's a way to envision where right. where we can get to, um, and different municipalities will achieve that in different ways. But certainly, most of the urban forest studies in the GTA show that private property is where the planting potential lies now mm-hmm. um, many municipalities have planted out their municipally owned property right um, so or they've paved it street. like the city of toronto right i mean when you look at yeah. something in toronto the, the the concrete and the paving and the condos going up is really taking away from i know they're adding the green roofs on on most of those i believe now um mm-hmm. that type of thing which is you know which is helping i guess i don't know if that counts towards their 30 to 40 percent but uh yeah so residents and I think the age, is that a factor? The age of some of those homes and those trees in the cities, some of the cities, right? Not just Toronto. 
Um, I'm sure our listeners are calling from all over that, you know, the trees that are are falling in these storms that we're having, you know, so now we're having to also replace existing mature trees. That's right. I mean, and, you know, sometimes in neighborhoods, a lot of the street trees were planted at or around the same time. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's interesting, like the the urban forest studies that are being done are so are so fascinating. Um, You know, again, each municipality is unique, but GTA trends really show um, that, you know, one of one of the big um, problems is that we're losing a lot of those mature trees. And um, those are very hard to replace yeah. in an urban area. Yeah. Um, very, very hard for so many reasons. Um, and uh, you know, one of the biggest and one of the major threats to the urban forest is really the way we develop. And, right. And um, whether that's um, infill development or new development, um, really what it comes down to is uh, the soil, the soil volume and quality that's left. Um, to grow. <laughs> um, so there's, you know, removal of existing trees, right. which is it was so devastating because, again, like, how do you replace, uh, you know, an, an oak that takes two or three people to, you know, stand around it and join hands to, to encircle it? I mean, how do you ever replace that? Right. Uh, especially when the soil volumes and qualities is declining, mm-hmm. you know, it's shrinking. And um, how, how to establish magnificent trees like that again? Yeah. So it's yeah I think I think that the way we develop is one of the biggest threats to the urban forest and um, new development of course you know uh, is also very challenging and the, the the soil that we're left with after the houses are up um, we do a lot of planting in backyards in areas of new development and uh, ooh to say it's compacted clay is uh, an understatement. Yeah. <laughs> uh, very little organic matter right. whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the idea there is get the storm water off and down and out right. of the way. Um, but the soil that's left to try to establish trees in, it's, it's very challenging. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it limits the species that we can plant. And um, really, the soil has to be rehabilitated um, in a lot of ways. Wow. Yeah. That, there's so much that goes into that. Um, so part of the program, are we educating the homeowners or, you know, are you uh, educating them as far as the amending of the soil that they need to do, but prior to planting or are you do taking care of that for Um, them? So the way we approach it, I mean, we, again, I go back to my, my, my permaculture roots as often as I can. And, um, I, I think one of the best ways to amend soil is from top, is top dressing is continual adding of organic matter and onto the top. And, um, and where possible, even things like sheet mulching. Mm-hmm. Um, so we don't add, well, sometimes we will add an amendment to the soil if it's, if it's really abysmal. But if we amend the hole too much, then the, the roots are just going to encircle into um, the hole that has the amended soil. So, you know, we'll rough up the sides. Of course, all of the things that you need to do when planting in challenging soil, like that rough up the sides, um, you know, mix in a little bit of maybe black earth, um, but then really encourage people to continuously add mulch and compost to the top um, as it decomposes, as it disappears, adding more. Um, Sheet mulching is one of the best things I have ever learned through permaculture. And back in my gardening days, I did a lot more of it, but just um, I'm kind of a lazy gardener. Like I I like nature to do the work. (laughs) Right, right. So what do you mean by sheet garden, sheet mulching? Absolutely. It's the best. And um, so, you know, you just, you you find cardboard. Um, Cardboard is usually the the ink is vegetable based. So it's pretty safe to use. Um, If you've got a grass area that you want to turn into a garden bed or um, just mulch uh, under your trees and shrubs, you just, put the cardboard down and cover it with wood chips and it takes care of the grass. There's no digging. You Mm -hmm. don't disrupt the roots of existing trees and you just continually top dress that, um, with organic matter. And it's, it's really the best way I've found to improve soil quality much better than turning it over Mm -hmm. and disturbing the soil horizons and layers. So yeah, we really encourage people to, to do that. But I mean, in those new developments, that's a, that's a long, that can be a long, slow process. Right. We, we do encourage and we offer also shrubs, which are tend to be hardier and easier to get established. And um, just bringing back, you know, some of those native plants 
to the yard can as the as leaves fall and decompose and so on you know that's another way to um, gradually improve the soil over time get some shrubs in there um, not uh, quite as hard as a tree to establish um, and also great for um, habitat mm-hmm. and certainly makes up a lot of our urban forest cover actually um, shrubs are included when uh, when we do studies on the urban forest we look at trees mm-hmm. and shrubs it's all about the leaf right um, okay surface mm-hmm. area mm-hmm. okay so it's not so just leaf- trunks like it's not you're not counting trunks necessarily you're looking yeah. at the, the, the foliage yeah I mean Different studies use different methods. Um, so in some cases, they're doing a plot-based system where you actually do go out and count stems. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you look at the uh, canopy cover, like say just picture an aerial shot looking down what's green and what's not, um, all of those shrubs make up a huge, you know, a really big component of the urban forest and so much habitat, you know, a lot of them are fruiting, you know, nut bearing, etc. They have so much value. So we really encourage people to think about the layers of the urban forest. Again, that takes me back to my, my permaculture mm-hmm. days, uh, um, you know, the seven layer forest and looking at uh, everything from the top canopy all the way down to those little, you know, spring ephemerals mm-hmm. that come out. Um, and the ground covers. You yeah, know, Matthew, all... are smi- Matthew and I are smiling because it's the same with the landscape design, right? I mean, that's we're both landscape designers, and when that's why when homeowners call us in, I mean, it's they're just calling us in for a quote unquote garden or a tree, but really it's our job to look at the whole thing. Um, so we might be maybe a bit more on the aesthetic side than you are in the environmental side, but I think we hopefully I, I try to educate the the different layers that that are involved. Um, yeah. you know, on, on uncovering the season, not only the seasons, but for, for, um, our native creatures, that type of thing. So, uh, so yeah, there are many, many parts, uh, of a garden. And it's so complex and that's the beauty of it. And it goes back to that, like the complexity of nature mm-hmm. itself is that's the beauty. It's, it's fascinating when you start to learn about it, how complex it is and what a web and, how we're part of that yes and and you know in a city sometimes we feel very separate from that but you don't need a lot of space to reconnect and and recapture that sense of being connected to nature um you know it, it can happen in a in a small space and and uh it's quite remarkable yeah. for me that's just been really key at um i'm just so happy that i've been able to work in something that i love and feel that connection even though I'm in, you know, a very dense city. Yes. And our listeners are kind of come from all over. So whether they're in large cities or even in the suburbs like Matthew and I are. Um, so we've talked about development being an issue. Are there what other types of issues or threats are there facing our urban forests? And by urban, I, I think you mean the, the suburbs as well as the big cities, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think we mean, at, you know, anywhere where there are human settlements within the mm-hmm. forest. And and urban forests are often quite disturbed. They're not necessarily like a natural undisturbed ecosystem because there is all that, you know, new development, uh, suburbs, uh, a lot of human activity, roads, et cetera, are in there. But, um, yeah, so definitely urban, uh, peri-urban, suburban, all of those kinds of areas we include in the term urban forest. I would say um, one of the other big sort of umbrella threats is, is climate change and how it's exacerbating a lot of um, stresses Mm. on the urban forest. So, for example, um, drought is a major stress to urban trees. And again, if they don't have the same kind of soil volume that you would have in a natural forest, the area from which their roots can actually draw moisture is usually restricted. And all of the paved surfaces in our cities and our developed neighborhoods roads, sidewalks, etc., run right off into the sewer systems mm-hmm. usually. So we don't get the same infiltration of rain uh, in an urban forest that you would in a natural forest. So most of our city trees are suffering from drought anyway just because of that. Right. And then add on the extreme weather now that we're experiencing. Um, so you know, the fluctuations, you know, uh, flash storm where the water comes, the rain comes down so fast massive majority of it just runs off Mm -hmm. 
um, yeah. and then periods of drought in between that. So that's definitely exacerbated by by climate change. Um, the you mentioned earlier the uh, the storms and just the intensity of the storms that we have now, um, the speed of the winds, mm-hmm. the both summer and winter storms yes. are very um, very damaging. And again, when you have trees that are already suffering from drought, they may be a lot more brittle. Um, then you suddenly get, you know, this this violent storm, um, definitely more prone to things like um, breakage and, and damage during storms. And of course, that's a problem in an urban forest because there's a lot of targets underneath those trees. So, um, you know, sometimes just in order to prevent risk, we have to um, prune or remove trees and and so I think these violent storms are, are really also um, part of the whole climate change, the new climate that, that we're experiencing. And then, of course, um, invasive insects and, and that problem uh, on its own and now exacerbated again by climate change. We're all sort of wondering what's the next thing going to be. So we've just experienced and, and some areas still experiencing um, emerald ash borer, which is uh, mm-hmm. an insect that bores into the any um ash tree and and it's usually fatal within a couple you know a few years there there are some treatments but uh really the insect has just devastated the ash tree population um in southern ontario and it's still happening in some of the northern uh, municipalities of york region they're still standing ash but a lot of them are um very close to (laughs) their last days so Actually, through our program, we have a new um, emerald ash borer rebate for for homeowners who are replacing ash trees. The the region of York is actually giving an extra subsidy for wow. those folks. That's a great thing. And yeah. I read about that uh, reading about your program. So I think as for a homeowner who lost, I had three city trees on my property and all three were ash trees um, <laughs> and lost them in. Well, the, they were, the borer was getting them, but the ice storm took them out first. So. Uh, right. So, yeah. So I think and I visit many clients who just can't, you know, it's overwhelming to, to think of replacing all of their ash trees. Um, so I, kudos goes to York Region. Um, I think that's great. Absolutely. You know, they're quite a leader in the urban forest mm-hmm. sector, I would say. And they've been a really supportive uh, partner for us. Um, and the geography of York Region is pretty, it's, it's huge. Yes. It's, it's a very big area, lots of diverse municipalities. Um, and they, but they, they definitely, yeah, they, they're, they're doing some great things, and and our other partners too, City of Toronto, um, Town of Ajax. Just um, you know, I, I find the municipalities are really stepping up. Mm-hmm. Um, one challenge is that there is really no support for urban forests at the provincial or federal levels. Um, the municipalities are kind of left to their own right. to deal with the, this stuff, and and even you know, uh, not a lot of support in terms of. Uh, uh, research and and policy development for urban forests. Again, each municipality kind of having to invent its own um, policies. Now they do collaborate, but there's no central, say, provincial resource where municipalities can go to say, okay, what's the best practice for, um, you know, whatever it is that they're that they're tackling. Right. Uh, right. The tree protection bylaw. Or, you know, they 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 have to go out and figure it out. Mm-hmm. Um, each on their own so that's that's actually part of why um i joined the the green infrastructure ontario coalition um which you mentioned in the at the outset mm-hmm. there um it's looking at the bigger picture it's looking at how what is the role of the province and the and the federal government in urban forests you know like over 80 percent of our residents live in urban areas and um yet most of the forestry stuff that is done at the federal and provincial level is is Sort of that traditional forestry kind of right. thing, as opposed to, um, you know, protecting and 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 improving our urban forests. So we're really trying there to look at some of these bigger picture mm-hmm. policy issues and how do we shift the thinking from just gray infrastructure in cities to we also need green infrastructure, right. living green infrastructure mm-hmm. in our cities, and if we don't have that. Cities are, are not nice places to live in yeah. <laughs> yeah. without Absolutely. without that. Yeah. So um, you know, shifting our thinking to say, well, living green infrastructure is just as important as gray infrastructure, roads, yeah. buildings, you know, all that stuff that's important to yeah. our lives. 
but the green is too and we've kind of taken it for granted and neglected it and and it's time that we have to really proactively protect and manage it help it yes because time is not on our side i know there's always that famous saying that when is the best time to plant a tree and it's usually 20 years ago (laughs) you know (laughs) Um, so there's, uh, so I would say that the lack of coordination on, on cities and, and provincial and, and federal levels would also be a, a big factor, um, in the sense of a major threat facing the urban forest because, uh, you know, they're not thinking the big picture. And I think when it comes to something, it's not, a, it's not a fix. Like the tree's not going to grow as fast as a, we can put a road in or we can put a building in, Right. That's right. So there's no, when it comes to, to looking at our urban forests, there's no, uh, it's not a quick fix. So the, the, we're the, and I think we're many years behind getting on top of that, which is why it's so much in the media right now. That's right. Don't you think? So, uh, yeah. Because we're seeing the impact of that, that we're losing, tre- when we're losing all those trees from Emerald Ash Borer, and when we're losing all those trees from the storms, mm-hmm. um, now we're even, you know, we're even set back even further. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, and it's a very visible difference when suddenly, you know, you had a tree lined street and you lose three or yeah. four of them. Oh, yeah. Or in my uh, case, a whole street like ash trees in, in Pickering. I come from Pickering. So, you know, they they were street after street were all ash trees. And, yeah. you know, I think we've improved there in that they learned when they replaced them, they were much more diverse in planting. Um, but back in the day, you know, you found something that worked and you just planted it all and, and uh, that wasn't uh, the best environmentally. So we have, uh, we have learned about that. And there's lots. And also thinking outside the boxes as the different trees that you're able to, to uh, plant, right? For uh-huh. city trees, for backyard trees. Um, so we do have a listener who's asking um, about fruit trees. So she, well, indirectly, Ralph is asking about that because we have another show on Reality Radio um, with uh, on th- about fruit trees and uh, Susan Poisoner. So our so our re- person is writing in asking if you've heard of Susan or are familiar with her show. Absolutely. Yes. Um, yeah. The uh, Orchard yeah, People. Susan. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah. Susan's amazing, and and I've known her for many years. And, uh, yeah, what she's done with orchard people is fantastic. Yes. And fruit trees are um, complex and completely um, unique, I think. And so her resources are amazing because it's, you know, growing fruit is, is an art and, uh, and a science. And I think, yeah, she's got awesome videos. She's a, You know, she's a filmmaker in her former life, and she actually did our – we have a – we have a DIY version of the program. Oh, okay. Uh, which basically where we, instead of the in-person consultation with the arborist, we do it virtually. Oh. So we um, screen share. with All you need is a computer and a phone. It's okay. not high tech. Um, <laughs> we, we use a screen sharing um, program. So we send a link to the, to the person and they just click on it. And we look at uh, aerial images of the yard. Ooh, Google. Excellent. And and we, we discuss the yard, we talk about all the things I mentioned we do in the in person consult, but we kinda of do it virtually and then we come up with a little map, we send uh, measurements, we send we send the species profile so people can see what the trees and shrubs are gonna look like, um, and all their characteristics. Um, but so we do the virtual consultation and then we deliver the plant material and the homeowner plants it themselves. Um so we did a series of videos for this program, four videos, and Susan is our filmmaker. Oh, there you go, Ralph. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I figure there was, you know, a, you know you're know, you there preserving trees in, in the urban forest, and she's there preserving fruit trees in the urban forest. So it definitely <laughs> is a great uh, synergy, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. There's so many great folks actually working on related issues. Yes. And that's, a, that's one thing, really lovely thing about being in a city is you connect with all these other amazing people yes, who, yeah. who care about the same thing, yeah. right? And and so that's that's definitely um, been very important to our success as an organization is just reaching out, connecting with, mm-hmm. and and getting help from all these great individuals and groups that are working toward a a common goal yeah and that's part of the reason why matt and i do this show i mean it's definitely it's a passion project for us and the more we can 
elevate um, the different speakers, the different organizations. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know we had Not Far From The Tree on a couple oh. weeks ago, um, oh, another oh. great organization supporting um, urban, the urban fruit trees, and which was a Susan connection, of course. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and homeowners, you know, helping them. We want to be here to help homeowners across, uh, you know, the, our listenership um, maintain and, and help their, their yards, so uh, yeah. their gardens and trees and shrubs. So we're he here each week tr and elevating the industry. So I think that's uh, big, isn't it, Matt? Like, yeah. This is where we do this every day. That's it. <laughs> every Monday, anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's a really wonderful platform, and, and it's a great way to network and bring people together. So, yeah, it's, it's great that you guys do this show. It's yeah. awesome. It's so great to be invited to be on here oh well thank you thank you i, I mean i've learned i've been watching following um leaf online and social media that type of thing and i really you know and that's one this is kind of a shortcut and that i can't learn about everything on my own so uh <laughs> so this is great invite you on and you get to teach me all about it <laughs> so earlier you were talking about um was it the backyard tree planting program yeah. Specifically? Okay. And and just we haven't done uh, like an ID for you, so we've talked about a lot about LEAF, but where can our listeners go to find out more about you online? Yeah, so our website address is yourleaf.org. So it's Y-U-O-R, leaf.org. And our website is a great place to learn about all the different programs we've got going on. Um, the Backyard Planting Program, like I said, is one of our, our longest-running programs, but we have a lot of other community engagement programs that um, have evolved over the years. So there's lots of different ways to get involved. Um, we have a lot of, uh, an amazing team of, um, well, our staff team, first of all, which I have to say is awesome, <laughs> dedicated, young people who just care so much about the urban forest oh, great. And, and, you know, what they do. And inspiring for me every single day and I feel that's another um, very fortunate thing for me to have had so many young people come through the organization and work at the organization and bring their energy and commitment and then we have this amazing group of volunteers um, hundreds of volunteers that help us in so many different ways everything from coming out to um, you know a community planting on public land where you can come and plant uh, trees and shrubs with us um, in a group to helping us in the office with mm -hmm. data entry, to going out to our events, um, photographers who take amazing photos for us, uh, and just just so many ways that volunteers help us out. Uh, we have um, we have demonstration gardens at five locations in in Toronto. Okay, um, most of them are near subway stations, so they're sort of high foot traffic areas, mm. and they're just small spaces that we've converted into little urban forest demonstration gardens. Oh, that's a and great idea! Yeah, it's they're all maintained by volunteers. Ah. Uh, it's just you know it's it's fabulous, and when when there's when you invite people, you know, to take part in something, it's just very uh, encouraging and heartening to see the response and how people do want to get involved and, mm -hmm. um, and so many different ways. So there's, there's something for everybody. We have an outreach team, folks that um, go out with a table and display to different, you know, public events and right. uh, talk about urban forest issues and LEAF and how to get involved. So we've got lots of opportunities for people to get involved. So if you just go to our website, you'll see... Um, you know, all of our different programs described, and then you'll see the volunteer um, section where you can learn a bit more and fill in an application to volunteer with us. We have orientation sessions happening regularly, too. Okay, so. okay. Did you want to speak a bit about the, uh, the other program, the Young Urban Forest Leaders Program? Sure, yeah. This is an exciting, um, speaking of young, engaged, energetic people, um, this is a fantastic program where we um, offer training and mentorship to a group of young people um, over about a six-month period. Uh, in the last few years, it's been um, focused on the young people working with a local community group in order to start up and adopt a park tree program. Oh, okay, now define young. Like, what age are we talking? So, 18 to 29 is oh, our okay. age group okay. now. Our applications, actually, I think, are currently open for any young people who are keen. Um, and it's 
it's a sort of a four hour per week kind of a commit volunteer commitment, but you do get a lot of training and mentorship and support. Um, you learn a lot of skills, not only around trees and urban forest, but also around community engagement and uh, event planning and these kinds of things. So Very cool. um, this year we're focusing, our, our youth are going to be focusing, kind of broadening their focus. So not just necessarily an adopt a park tree program, which engages the local community in watering and caring for young park trees, um, but also could um, involve other things like adopting street trees, mm. um, promoting planting on private property. Mm-hmm. So basically it's going to be a bit more of a, a greening a whole neighborhood effort. Okay. And But we'll work in partnership with a local neighborhood group who wants to achieve some of those greening goals and work hand in hand with them, um, with the youth doing, a, you know, helping out with some of that legwork yeah. um, to really get citizens and the community engaged. Right. So it's really great. And like the youth are amazing. And um, we culminate in a fireside chat at the end of the six months with um, four urban forest champions or leaders that work in different sectors. So you, we usually have someone from academia, someone from the private sector someone from the municipal sector and someone from the nonprofit sector who's been working in, in the sector a long time and they get to meet them and hear about what's their day-to-day work like. Um, you know, kind of thinking like what career path options right. are there for me? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it's really great. It's, it's a very, I get very excited talking about it. <laughs> uh, we, we've actually had quite a few um, young people who have done that and then ended up working with Leaf. Um, oh, wonderful. Afterwards, wonderful. yeah. yeah. So, so is it a, primarily a Toronto base, like a, a young urban? Are, is it folks in Toronto, or is it also in some is, of the other municipalities? Yeah, this one is the only municipality where we have this program is Toronto Okay. Um, currently. Uh, it's definitely one we'd love, to, we'd love to grow. I think it's got lots of potential, so mm-hmm. fingers crossed. Yeah. Maybe we can expand it. Excellent. Uh, but currently Excellent. it's just in Toronto, yeah. Okay, well let us know what we can do to help you expand. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean we've had, uh, you know, because several of the colleges and the in the communities, like I think of the horticulture that's happening uh, Shane Jones at, at Durham, Durham College, College. Yeah. you uh, know, they're doing some great work out there. Uh, so yeah, so I think uh, if, yeah, if you need some connections or you need us to to kind of spread the word more, we're happy to, happy to do that because I think it's a great program yeah, most and, uh, and out of Durham region, Ajax is the only one participating. Um, Currently, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So how can we help? How can I, as a you know, a citizen of Pickering and, and mm-hmm. Matt of Oshawa, how can we help get you kind of into into our communities? Well, you can always contact your counselor okay. and say, hey, uh, we love this program. It's offered in uh, this municipality. We'd love to have it here. Um you know, can can you uh, support it or look into it? I mean, most of our, like I said, our partnerships now are, are municipal. Mm-hmm. So, um, okay. you know, getting some, you know, su- support from the municipality um, is really key and important for us. So, I mean, that's that's one thing. And, and even contacting the municipality itself, the, you know, the park section or forestry section, if you have one, mm-hmm. and saying, hey, have you guys looked into a partnership possibly with, and the region. Region. I mean, yeah. I think mm. one key for us in in uh, the municipalities in York Region has been the regional partnership. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, that has been very, very key. Um, so, I mean, I think a lot of municipalities and in, in Durham Region, for example, are are interested in Keene. They have a lot of priorities, um, competing priorities. Yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely. But, you know, the more they hear from citizens. Yeah, uh, what those what their priorities are, the the better. So right. there's no right. harm in in letting them know. <laughs> okay. No, yeah. that's definitely good because I know in York Region definitely we've had a show a few weeks ago on fusion gardening. You know, yeah. managing the rainwater. I mean, they are leading the pack on that one as well. Uh, yeah. So definitely, uh, they are uh, becoming the leader in in really kind of uh, climate addressing climate change and addressing some of our uh, issues. Absolutely. And, and another one of my mentors who is soon to retire is actually the York Regional Forester, Ian Buchanan. Um, and he's just an amazing guy and such an inspiration. And I think, you know, for me, uh, both he and Andy Kenny, really, even though they're very, prof- like one is very academic professional, the other a municipal professional, they really saw the value of community involvement mm-hmm. yeah. in urban forest stewardship. And they truly 
you know, felt that that was a key component to successful urban forest management. And uh, that was just so refreshing and wonderful, you know, that that they they recognized that and really nurtured that in myself and others and uh, were there to support us and and seeing us as as a, an equally important stakeholder, yeah, yeah. you know, in, in the urban forest. And I think that's just, Excellent. that's made all the difference. Mm-hmm. You know, it's certainly been um, very, very uh, key to, to our success. And, right. uh, and so, yeah. Um, yeah. So just to, you know, our time, the hour always goes really fast <laughs> and always yeah. flies. Um, so our listeners are not just in, you know, Ontario, uh, you know, we want to shout out to them that people from the uh, U.S. and Canada um, so is there something uh, that you recommend, like what can one person do to enhance and support our forests or the forest near them or our yard, you know, street trees? We've, we, Matt and I kind of talk about our street trees a bit on the show. Um, do you have a couple of tips as we start to wrap up um, what you, what home, what your average person can, can kind of do to have a bit of impact? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think there's a lot of small acts that each of us, can do and it's it's again it's kind of about that like looking around and seeing what what is closest to you what's around it might be um it might be planting on your own property Mm -hmm. learning about what's you know what to plant how to plant it for the long-term success it might be watering uh, a street tree that's suffering from summer drought um it might be um talking to your neighbor who's doing some construction and about to excavate and possibly do a lot of damage to tree roots without really knowing Mm -hmm. that they're going to do that. Um, It could be joining a local community group, um, whether there's already a group that focuses on on tree issues. Maybe there's an environmental group that, you know, um, might take up that issue or, um, you know, who's out there in, in... in your local area, I think there's so many things locally mm-hmm. that we can each do. Um, even, you know, uh, just talking about it, learning a bit about it and sharing that information with others. You yeah. know, the fact that um, we did a campaign around uh, um, bees love trees. Mm-hmm. Like we think of uh, yeah. perennials Flowers, as yeah. being very important yeah. for bees, but shrubs and trees, the, yeah. the, the blossoms, every tree flowers. Mm-hmm. And it's not as showy, so we don't necessarily notice it. But right. they're amazing pollinator supporters, and a lot of people are concerned about bees right now. I yes. mean, um, learning about that and sharing that information. I think, you know, whatever action you enjoy, I think that's so key is like if it's something you enjoy, your passion will come through. And um, there's so much that each of us can do. Small acts make up major accomplishments. Um, and, and, and really move us to, to our common goal. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, there is so much we can do, and that's a great um, I, you know, concept about bees love trees because trees often are leafing out and flowering earlier than many perennials, um, so that tends to be a, a, the, one of the first food sources, isn't that? That's right. Yeah. That's right, absolutely, and we, a lot, it goes unnoticed really yes i mean yeah. when i when i started to learn about native bees and how different they are from honeybees and the mm-hmm. fact that they nest in the ground and yes. they're solitary and it was like what my yeah. mind is being blown yeah <laughs> yeah it's so exciting yes to learn about how everything is connected yeah yeah you know? we're constantly yeah. updating you know it kind of encouraging people to leave their gardens messy and not to clean up too early in the spring and all those different things that you know it's really changing the way we've always done it right yeah, absolutely. and because realizing the impact that we have that some of our small the small little things that we do have a big impact uh, right. so uh, so yeah so I think this has been great I, I think we could probably do a whole other couple more shows oh, on yeah. your different <laughs> programs Janet so uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah so while as we're going Matt why don't you wrap up on the where we can uh, find out more more from Janet. Oh well, yeah, you can uh, you know visit their website uh, www.yourleaf.org. Uh, Janet, I think you can find you on Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Uh, yes. So follow around at Facebook is at Local Enhancement and Appreciation of Forests. Follow them on Twitter at at Leaf is their handle, and uh, Instagram is at Leaf underscore org. 
as well. And, you know, check out all the, the cool programs that you were describing on your website and uh, all the links to your social media there as well, I believe. Yes. Yeah. And we've just scratched the surface. Yeah. I know you have about nine or more uh, programs <laughs> going. So I'm just excited that we were able to uh, fill everybody in on more details on the uh, the backyard planting program mm-hmm. and talk a little bit about the young urban uh, leaders program. So, uh, so yeah. So I think we've got a lot more that we can talk about another time, don't you think? Yeah, I would love. I would love that. I'd love to come back anytime. Excellent, excellent. So that's great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Oh, we do have another question. Oh, I yeah. left at the end. Um, in your bio, we mentioned uh, that you volunteer for a dog rescue organization. So we did have a listener write in and ask about which one. Oh yeah. Oh, I'd love to give them a little plug. Um, adopt a dog, save a life. Oh, okay. I've, I've adopted a dog from there, too. Have you? Yeah. Oh, that's so amazing. And Marianne, the woman who yes. runs it, is the best. Uh-huh. Um, I have volunteered with them for about six years since my uh, last dog, who lived to the age of 18, Ooh. passed. And it was, you know, very devastating. He was my, he was my you know, daily companion. Yeah. He actually, he and, and my other dog helped me build leaf they came to work every day they were with me and so when I lost him I was just you know not ready to commit to another dog but I started to foster right away and I've I've been you know volunteering with them ever since and I now have my um my Bentley who uh did manage to work his way I didn't I didn't know if I could love another dog oh there you (laughs) go you know it's a little it's a different relationship but it's just as amazing yes as yeah i'm so thankful they brought me bentley who's Excellent. my yeah. my beloved little uh he's a he's a little white poodly guy oh great so save a dog adopt a dog save a life save a life See, that's, that's right, right is a wonderful adoption agency that's so funny of all the ones uh, that and we both know about <laughs> that one so that's great <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you for giving them the plug. And uh, we thank you for being here to tell us more about urban, our urban forests. And we definitely love to do another show. I think this is great. Yeah. Awesome. Look look forward to having you again. Yes. So bye for now. Thanks for the opportunity. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Wow. Well, that's a big topic. Big topic. Great information. Yes. Um, Definitely your, uh, your leaf dot org lots of info great program so definitely uh check those guys out for sure yeah and i think look around again i know not all of our listeners are here in ontario but um you know reach out and see what's going on in your neck of the woods you know what type of tree planting um organizations are out there what type of volunteer organizations Mm. are out there whether you're backyard planting in the trees or planting in more um you know uh What's the neighborhoods, more um, private, public property, that type of thing. So I think there's a lot of grassroots organizations out there. Yeah. Um, I'm happy that we found this one. If you know of others that you want us to feature on the show, we are more than happy to yeah. uh, to spread the word. Because I think it's going to be, it's one of those things, I think it's going to start from the ground up. Um, because up above us, they're, they're too busy worrying about other things. So I, right. I think it's, it's coming down to uh, everybody. Uh, working together to uh, really address the things that are happening in our climate. Exactly. And even though we're based here in uh, the GTA of uh, Ontario, Canada, you know, if our state's listeners or anywhere else has something, you know, a a cool organization that's really doing something to improve, you know, the environment or the green industry, write us because we'd love to talk to them as well. It doesn't have to be just here in Ontario, Canada. That's right. That's right. So once again, we're out of time. We're out of time. Thank you, Patty and Ralph, for writing in those questions. Uh, Thank you, Janet, for joining us on the show. That's right. And remember, Remember to subscribe to Down the Garden Path on your favorite podcast app. And uh, thank you for joining us here on uh, Down the Garden Path on Reality Radio 101. Thank you for listening to Down the Garden Path with your hosts, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing, right here on Reality Radio 101.